Hi folks, I'm not sure you know this, but the world is falling apart. Our glorious leaders are doing an immensely good job at dealing with it, and everyone has been happier than ever before. So, I want to tell you a story about how everything is perfectly fine. It's fine. In 2018, Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg protested outside of parliament every Friday to protest the public handling of the climate crisis. A lot of people joined her in these protests. It eventually became a global movement of mostly children who are fed up and angry with how the people in charge are doing anything. Because it turns out that year after year after year of climate conferences, things never get any better. If anything, it feels like things are just getting worse and worse and worse. These protests become huge. Greta herself becomes a household name, gets floated for a Nobel award, um, meets various world leaders and becomes very famous. She even ends up on the cover of Times Magazine as the person of the year. And then, what happened? Did anything happen? Greta was harassed and was said to either be an undisciplined child or an unwitting tool for eco-evangelists. People would make horribly offensive stickers, and people would accuse her family of being paid by climate establishment figures. And of course, some people blamed Soros for this as well. But why would people want to attribute such traits to someone who is very critical of the status quo? In 2020, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. became President of the United States of America, running on a platform of, among other things, a strong climate policy. A lot of people hailed Joe Biden as one of the most progressive presidents the US has ever seen. Not only does he win the presidency, but also the Democrats get a majority in the House and the Senate of the United States. And a lot of people are very excited. Joe Biden promises to return to normal after the dumpster fire that had just preceded him. Biden says, I'll take care of you. Just trust me and I'll make all the problems go away. This isn't a video on American politics, but I feel like it comes up quite a lot. But the message of the Democrats and the messaging of a lot of governments throughout the world right now is stop complaining and trust the people in charge. The only way to deal with the crises that are coming up is to return to the normal, to gather around what we know, to trust the establishment. The term the establishment is one that has only recently become mainstream during the last presidential election in the US. However, the idea that the establishments represent is not a new one. Very simplified, the establishment is an idea that organizations or social structures are controlled by a vague elite somewhere in society. There's no secret that for the last couple of decades there's been a growing dissatisfaction with how things are run. Sure, the stock market might be up, but are things actually getting better for anyone? The police are killing people, cost of living is going up, wages stay suppressed, schools are becoming more expensive and also worse, and everyone is feeling the frustration. Not to mention that we all feel like frogs being slowly boiled alive during a climate catastrophe that is probably going to not be resolved. At least, not currently. And on top of it all, your rent just went up. Just check your mail. Check your mail. While you're watching this video, your rent went up 10%. And if there's any good that has come out of the current COVID pandemic, it is that it has shown us the reality of how fragile our current system actually is. And it turns out that everything can just break down, just like that. And when we look to our leaders for clarity and vision, what do we get? Silence. This causes frustration, conflict, anger, justified anger, at the people who are in charge. If they can't do even the basic things right, 
how can we trust them regarding anything? Frustration at the establishment doesn't necessarily have to be organized. It doesn't necessarily have to be around a significant person or a movement. It can be individual. You watching this video is probably frustrated about something that is happening in the world. Something that maybe you weren't frustrated with a few years ago. And while you could chalk that up to people being more politically aware, I don't think that that's actually the full answer. I think one answer is that we can all see the problems in society and that they're not going away. But I can hear you asking, who are the establishment? In concrete terms, it can't just be a feeling of people in charge. It has to be an individual. And I will name some names, but a structure such as the foundations of our entire society can't be pinned down to individual people, even people who are ostensibly in charge. Structures, especially societal structures, are made up by millions and millions of people. Everything from a president to a prime minister, all the way down to your local librarian. All working on the rules of society, the unspokable social contract. Social contract theory is the idea that we all follow the rules of society because we expect to reap the benefits of society if we all participate in it. I go to work, I don't murder people, I pay taxes, and I can assume that I won't be murdered, there will be someone working in the cafe that I go to, and there will be social services available for me thanks to taxes. What really is the social contract? An agreement of the citizen with the government? The social contract is an agreement of man with man. An agreement from which must result what we call society. In essence, it means that we all willingly participate in our society and our democracy because we believe that it works and that we will get something out of it. In modern terms, a contract between the people and the people in charge. The consent of the governed. If we stop believing in that contract, or if we feel that one party isn't holding up their deal, it also fails to work, and the people will begin to try to find or make a new social contract, a new society. Even if you don't agree with some or even most of the rules that society has, as in laws and regulations, you might still have a general idea of how things are done. And so to a lesser extent, we're all part of the system. We don't have a choice not to be. But that begs the question. Obviously, I'm not part of the political establishment of the world. I don't have the kind of power. We all instinctively know who belongs to the establishment and who doesn't. There might be a gray area, but for the most part, we can all kind of tell. So, how do we tell? Depends on who you ask. Nothing's ever easy, is it? If you ask, for example, a communist, they'll tell you all about Marxist theories of structure and superstructure, conflict theory, uh, the idea of class conflicts in general, millions of proletarians being in subservience to an elite capitalist class. The people who are the establishment are the people who own, the people who own land, the people who own businesses, the people who own all of the things that the rest of us have to work and sacrifice our time to sacrifice and support just to be able to exist. Or, for most people, the rich. The rich are the establishment. And this, you might think, is true. It is definitely true, to some degree. Because while it might be true on a global level, there are more levels here. It is people who are in power, but specifically rigid power. Meaning that despite attempts to dislodge them from that power, you're gonna have a tough time doing it. They're deep in the foundations of whatever niche or subculture that they belong to. Secondly, they happily take part of that subculture. They're happily part of the structure. And third, they don't want to change it. And they will actively try to resist attempts to do so. And although the left has been trying to discuss this topic for a couple of years now, this is something that was perfected by the right wing 
for much, much longer. Albeit with slightly different language. And don't worry, this is not a video about Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Democrats or Republicans or Labour or Tories or the CDU or whatever. This video is about the idea of the establishment. However, Donald Trump and Joe Biden work as wonderful examples here. Illustrations that help us paint a picture of a much, much larger system. Donald Trump is an example of someone who is not at least viewed as part of the establishment by his supporters. A significant part of the reason why he won the 2016 presidential election was because Hillary Clinton, his opponent at the time, was seen as part of this old, established, very status quo -y elite. An elite that doesn't actually do that much for most people. Donald Trump comes in and says, you may not like what I think, you may not like what I say, but I am going to change something. And at the very least, I'm going to change the other side or force them to do something about me. And many people are, go along with that. Even people who don't actually like Trumpism, for lack of a better term. For example, he talked about draining the swamp, taking on Wall Street, ideas that most people kind of want. Ideas that speak to the frustrations within them. The problem, of course, is that Donald Trump takes these ideas and sprinkles in, or rather, uses it as set dressing for much more dangerous and harmful ideas. It's exactly this reason why some people were torn between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Not because the two politicians had similar voting structures or were appealing to the same like racism or misogyny like some people wanted to think, but rather because these were basically the two options that wasn't the status quo. Now, Donald Trump isn't actually anti-establishment, we'll get to that later, but he spoke to this mass of people. The philosopher Slavo Žižek mentions that supporting Donald Trump could actually be kind of a good thing because he's so outside the political norm and the political establishment that he will be a shock to the system that is the American political structure. A shock that may force some type of change. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have happened. During the 2020 election, instead of offering some type of alternative to Donald Trump on the side of anti-establishmentism, the Democrats opted to go full into the establishment, a return to normalcy, choosing Joe Biden, a tactic that worked, but maybe not for the right reasons as the Democrats think. Now you may say, Donald Trump did lose the 2020 election, so maybe the anti-establishmentism was actually a bad idea. Again, Donald Trump was a lot more than anti-establishment, I personally believe that a big reason why people voted for Joe Biden was simply because they just hated Donald Trump so much. Not necessarily because Joe Biden was a better alternative. And from judging his current approval ratings, I think I'm kind of right in that. People didn't want the establishment back, they just wanted rid of Donald Trump. Now obviously, Donald Trump wasn't actually against any sort of establishment, the swamp was never drained, he never took on Wall Street, uh, and so the frustrations that people felt are still around. And similarly with Joe Biden, the status quo remains unchanging and unmoving. Now, these frustrations don't just express themselves in who people want to vote for. It also expresses itself as doubt. Who can you trust anymore? Can you trust the election officials? Can you trust anyone? Suddenly, the rules of society no longer apply because the rules of society are mostly just enforced by the people at the top. And they're clearly wrong, so what do we do about it? So the frustrations keep growing and growing, and the culture war that we're currently in keeps getting worse and worse and worse.
Ah, vous savez ce qui se passe. What happens is, more often than not, violence and revolution. You know, dear viewer, that they take those frustrations out on each other. So let's talk about revolution. Is it the only way forward? And if it is, then why does it seem like it's not actually going to happen? However, this is a Mia Mulder channel. We need to go through some history basics first. Put on the, the German hat. So we need to talk about the history. So let's start at the one that everyone knows about. The one where Robespierre got a little bit wild. The French Revolution stands out because it is particularly violent, but also sudden. First of all, violent executions of the monarchy wasn't a new thing. It had been done before. And carving out new republics where maybe you didn't think you were able to make one had also been done before. Many French revolutionaries were directly influenced by the American Revolution. Because it turns out that if you have enough guns, you can just make a new country. Actually, with the same logic, McDonald's will serve breakfast at 3 p.m. if you have a gun. And that's exactly what many French revolutionaries thought as well. What if we just start fresh? A big reason why the French Revolution actually had supporters was because people were fed up with what they called the Anchine Regime. I can't pronounce anything, I'm Swedish. Basically, the old rule. The old rule represents basically everything that had been going on in France from around the Middle Ages all the way up to 1789. Feudal rule, the king is in charge. That's not to say that things were static, or that the status quo remained. A common misunderstanding about history is that real progress only really happened in the last couple of decades, but the eras of 1000 CE and 1400 CE were radically different. But the structures that existed in society hadn't changed too much. Of course, there had been major changes regarding who was actually in charge. Is it actually the king? Or is it the dukes, perhaps? Is it some kind of mid-tier system? Is it like a multi-level marketing scheme where you have an emperor at the top? <laughs> but what had happened is that the old rule had solidified itself deeper and deeper and deeper, specifically into the rule of the monarch themselves. This is what we today call absolutism. The monarch holds absolute power. In the minds of many thinkers of the day, this is the epitome of what the feudal system, or the old rule, could accomplish. This is the end of history from their point of view. The king has all the power, so that's it. No more need for change. Now, some of the radicals of the French Revolution argued that everything that had to do with the Anchine regime had to be done away with, including things like measuring systems, dates, the concept of time. Everything could be made anew into a new, more sustainable order. And honestly, they were kind of onto something. The current date system we have right now is fucking whack. And from a modern perspective, you may look at the revolutionaries and think, well, of course they had the ideas of republicanism and freedom for all, liberté, égalité, NFT. <laughs> but that is because those values exist today. They didn't all exist during the time of the French Revolution completely. Some of these things are a given to us today, but they weren't of the revolutionaries of the time. We might think decimal time is strange, but so was the idea that nations didn't need a monarch, at least to some people. And many people would disagree about whether or not the changes that were happening were going too far. And we can see that this happens in the time of the revolution as well. Many who were actual revolutionaries would sometimes maybe not want to go too far. I mean, the old system worked pretty well, right? The real problem isn't the system, it's the people in charge. We just need to Pokemon go to the polls or to the guillotine. Eventually, after Robespierre decides to cut everyone's head off, a lot of people think that like, hey, this new order kind of doesn't work that well. You know what? This whole reign of terror thing, not my vibe. Yikes. And so a lot of people say, we just need to go back to the old system. We need to return to normal. 
The problem isn't the system, the problem is the monarch. So let's just get a new monarch. One that won't be as tyrannical. A kinder monarch. A moderate monarch. An establishment monarch. And the French Revolution did change a couple of things. France, French society, changed significantly. And this had the effect of alleviating some of the tension of people. But you know, now we have a constitutional monarch and you know what, that's kind of better than what we had before. So, you know, maybe I don't uh, behead any more people. But of course, not everyone was satisfied. After the French Revolution, a lot of the old powers of Europe decide, well, hold on. If the French are able to lose their monarch, the same thing could happen to us. And most of the European powers decide to crack down. Cranking a big lever that says oppression and turning it to 11. <laughs> the reason for this is obvious. Monarchs don't want to lose their heads. But this leads a lot of people who are dissatisfied with the status quo in those nations to be, again, even more dissatisfied. Which is why I want to talk about some other revolutions. Revolutions that may not be as successful either. I speak, of course, of the springtime of nations, the revolutions of 1848. God, I really sound like a history teacher at this point. Okay, kids, everyone start writing about Hungarian nationalism. No, Kaisa, no, Kaisa, don't. <laughs> do not unify Germany on absolutist principles, no. Do, do democratic or liberalism instead, yeah. The revolutions of 1848 were largely liberal and democratic uprisings all throughout Europe. There were protests and demonstrations in virtually every single European country of the time. And the reasons for these revolutions? Same as any revolution. Bad economy, bad harvest, dissatisfaction with the political elite, wanting to have a voice in society, and feeling like nothing is ever going to get better. And this became even worse when people started hearing about these newfangled people in the new world who could decide their own destinies, making entirely new republics where they could do whatever they want. Meanwhile, I'm stuck here beholden to some Austrian king who doesn't even speak my language. And their revolutions shake the foundations of Europe. Actually, France has a second revolution. This actually leads to the second French Republic because goddamn those French, they love revolutions. <laughs> The Austrian Empire is having a bad time, their Italian holdings are being rebellious, and the Poles are rising up against the Germans. That happens like five times in history. Basically, no one's having a good time. I mean, even the concept of a country didn't really exist at this time. You were beholden to your lord, to emperors and kings. The establishment of this time is very easy to identify. It's monarchies. They are the people who are in charge, they are the people who control society, they are the people who run the world. And people were kind of tired of it. Because why should a whole people be beholden to the whims of one guy? Surely people have the right to do self-determination, to choose their own path in the world. And that was the goal of many of these revolutionaries. And they all pretty much failed. A lot of these revolutions happened spontaneously. Basically, you and your buddies were sitting in a bar somewhere in the German Confederation, and you heard about like, hey, the Hungarians are up to something, and so are the Italians. And there are wide demonstrations in Palermo, and there are people marching on the streets in Paris. Maybe we should do the same. And again, with the French Revolution still in living memory, a lot of people knew that, hey, we could change the world if we really wanted to. These revolutions were what's called a bourgeois revolution. In comparison to what you're probably more familiar with, the proletarian revolution. This is because many of the revolutionaries were wealthy industrialists who in the wake of industrialization now had significant resources and wealth, but comparatively little power compared to the aristocracy. However, many of the revolutionaries were coalitions between reformists and bourgeois, proletarian, farmers, various types of serfs. And these revolutions are not well remembered today, partly because they failed. And I think that that's a shame, because it definitely downplays the severity of those revolutions. 
Tens of thousands of people died in these revolutions, and hundreds of thousands were exiled from their respective countries, because the emperors and kings were mostly still in charge, and they didn't want you around anymore. Because these revolutions caused major death and devastation, a lot of monarchists realized something very important, that if you don't change, you die. So while the revolutionaries failed in, for example, Denmark, it did lead to the abolition of the absolute monarchy there. Many other revolutionaries got a partial success, even though many of the revolutionaries were not alive to see their success. And this actually brings me back to the French Revolution, because a major reason why the French monarchy failed was because it was too rigid. It was, much like a bridge, not able to sway not able to bend to what the people actually want. And what happens when something isn't able to bend? It snaps. But I can already hear you say, what revolution do we need to do now? Sure, the status quo might be bad, but what's the alternative? What is there to actually do about the frustrations and tensions that exist in society? I don't have those answers. But one guy who was actually around in 1848 did have an idea. His name was Karl Marx. Karl Marx observes what happens in the revolutions of 1848 and succinctly realizes or develops his idea of conflict theory, which is a foundational idea that Marx kind of invented. Conflict theory is the idea that change in society come from struggle, from conflict. You want one thing, I want something else, those ideas will battle, and whoever wins, that's what's going to happen. It is the idea that change in society comes from struggle between classes, specifically. And while many people today talk about the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, in 1848 it was a struggle between the aristocracy and everyone else. But the revolutions, even though they failed, led to more power to the bourgeoisie power that has since then, along with other revolutions and uprisings, put them in charge of the world. Marx says that this struggle is what has driven most of human history. Conflict theory stands in opposition to consensus theory, the idea that change happens when everyone agrees to, that society is based on the idea that everyone just needs to overcome their differences and agree on what to do. Pokemon go to the polls. In our society, you may recognize this as taking whatever jobs you want and your boss tells you what to do, and everyone's happy. Consensus theory is the basis of the status quo, the idea that things shouldn't change. And while today it may be easy to say that conflict theory is left-wing and consensus theory is right-wing, they're not inherently one or the other. It simply is status quo versus change. Even in the Soviet Union, people in the status quo said that we don't need to change society anymore. We have achieved full socialism, full equality. It's done. Struggle over. The revolution has succeeded. But what is the conflict part of conflict theory? It's what I've been talking about this entire video. Inequalities between people. The inequalities, both when it comes to economic resources, access to food, but also democratic rights. The idea that you can express yourself. The idea of self-determination. These rights have always been available for the people who are in charge, but haven't always been available to the people in the bottom. And obviously, in a system where there is inequality, there will be people who will want actual equality. Hence, conflict. It's a whole question about whether or not that is moral or the right thing to do or practical. That doesn't really matter. The important thing is, what does it matter to the people who are involved in the conflict? What is the reason why you feel left out? Why are you angry? And that might be different for different people. For a lot of people on the left wing, it may be economic equality, the right to have housing, food, education, healthcare, things like that. 
But if you are concerned about property rights, you may be really angry and want to fight to the death in order to remain a landlord. <laughs> that can feel like an inequality. And all you need is the feeling and that can drive conflict. So no matter what side you pick or what question you have or what subculture or whatever, eventually you'll end up with two sides, they will fight until the inequality is resolved. These aren't absolutes, mind you. Obviously change can happen within a consensus system as well. Things do happen with the reforms, but real fundamental change, how a society is structured, the very ideas of our society, those, Marx says, can only really come about from conflict. Otherwise, you're just maintaining the status quo. For example, giving tenants extra money so that they can better cope with higher rents doesn't get rid of the problem of landlords. If there is a problem of inequality caused by landlords, and God who could imagine such a society, the only way to fix it is to change into a society that simply doesn't have them at all. And many fundamental ideas to society, such as, for example, the idea of private property could never be done away with in a consensus-based system. Even though most of human society hasn't had a concept of such a thing as private property, and things like these can't be done away with under a consensus-based system, because the people who benefit from it will never agree to let go of their own advantages. They will gather around the establishment. So let's return to the modern day. Right now, people want alternatives to the mainstream, alternatives to the establishment, and where they're turning currently seems to be far-right forces. Because, honestly, they're the only ones who are really properly organized, the ones who are offering an alternative. People may not like Donald Trump, but they like his vibe, they like his energy, they like what he brings to the table, mostly because he isn't the Democrats. Which I feel is pretty annoying, because Joe Biden's entire thing is that he isn't Donald Trump. Very solid argument for democracy. The oft-repeated line as to why people are doing this is because of economic anxiety. Something that, honestly, makes sense. Money, right now, is generally a sign of how well things are going. The more money you have, the better things are. But pundits use the term as a sort of magic word to just explain away all things that exist. No one comes up with an actual sociological argument. Everyone just like throws money at the problem, even philosophically. I don't think it is the full reason. I think it's part of it. Again, not having money makes you anxious. I know this from experience. But it's so much more than just paychecks. If you look outside the window now, you can see that the world is getting worse. There are more homeless, more unemployment, more general death due to COVID that no one apparently knows how to deal with. It's an anxiety that the world simply doesn't work anymore. And this is a vague feeling of dread. And a big part of why people feel this way is that people think that it doesn't matter who is in charge anymore. Because all of the big picture questions, the climate, wars, COVID, these things, it doesn't seem to matter who's in charge, because the problems just keep getting worse anyway. And this leads people to get the feeling that it isn't actually about the people in charge, it's about them being in charge at all. This is also a major reason why the revolutions of 1848 happened, because people got a taste of how revolutions could work by putting someone else in charge of France. And people saw that if you just put a new king, it doesn't matter how nice the king is, the king is still gonna do king shit. And king shit isn't actually a good thing. The problem, of course, as always, is ideology. Currently, the ideology of neoliberalism is digging in. It's standing firm. With many of its proponents arguing that actually this is the most fair and balanced world that we can have. And any problems with it doesn't come from the ideology itself, but rather from its undermining by enemy interests. This is partially what my dad Slavoj Žižek talks about when he mentions that everything is ideology. And the alternative that many people have gone towards is something that some people call 
populism. Which is weird, because almost no one is able to pin down what it actually is. Despite being unknowable, it's gotten significant amounts of support. And many people have been trying to distinguish what exactly it is about various populist politicians that makes them popular. Well, the real answer, I think, is that anything in the minds of many people is better than what's currently happening. The world is dying. Anything is better than what currently is going on. And someone coming along and promising to change it foundationally, even just by being different enough from the current establishment, seems like an attractive option. At worst, it's gonna change something, right? I mean, it can't get any worse. It just so happens that the people offering such an alternative are people in the far right. Our movement is about replacing a failed and corrupt, and when I say corrupt, I'm talking about totally corrupt, political establishment with a new government controlled by you, the American people. The Washington establishment and the financial and media corporations that fund it exist for only one reason, to protect and enrich itself. One argument that I've heard rolling around on the internet is that people are starting to find a love for authoritarianism, but I don't think that's the case at all. I think most people despise dictators and authoritarians. It's just that they really, really hate the establishment so much more. Even to the point where they will be okay with like a little bit of authoritarianism just so something will actually happen. And this distrust of our society seeps its way into everything. Not just of who is president or who is in the Senate, but even in our entertainment. The Hollywood elite the bread tube click. And when people become so distrustful of each other, people will start marking lines in the sand. This is a foundational part of populism. It's a major reason why people talk about an us versus them society right now. And this type of thinking exists everywhere, not just on the fringes of political politics. It's how people conflate hardcore Stalinists with center leftist Democrats because they're all part of the establishment anyway. Because from their point of view, because you're in opposition to them, it looks like you stand with the status quo. Tell you what I do, as I go and check out some basic facts about your hero Obama. He's not my hero, I'm how a heroic he comes idiot. Across. However, looks like is extraordinarily important here. Because who is the establishment and who is anti-establishment doesn't actually have anything to do with whether or not you have power or how ingratiated you are with the elites of society. It has to do with aesthetics. Returning to Donald Trump, who was gonna drain the swamp and take on Wall Street, didn't do that. Donald Trump is, of course, a very wealthy man who has ties deep within the establishment. He is the establishment. But he has perfected the idea of looking like he's not. This isn't just an American problem. The former white nationalist party of the Sweden Democrats here in Sweden claim to be the outsiders, fighting up for the common man, the common Swede, arguing that because they're shut out of the highest levels of politics, they are the only ones who are really talking real democracy. But of course, High-ranking politicians within the party are already ingratiated in many types of politics. The party also controls several areas of the country on a more local municipal level, and they already shift public opinion and policy on many issues. It's just that no one wants to play with them. And that's sometimes enough to be able to paint yourself as being against the man. The only alternative to this is apathy. I've talked about this before, but this is something that is also happening in America and throughout the entire Western world. Because obviously not everyone is going to flock to the far right just because the establishment is bad. But where do you go? Is there really a, such a radical solution offered from the left? If there's not, what do you do? A lot of people just choose to not do anything. 
and this is something that is leading more people into not voting. Or simply not believing that democracy is a good system at all, because obviously it doesn't really work. And this leads to lower voter turnout, which, in the perspectives of some, leads to the problem becoming worse. However, a lot of these anti-establishment parties have managed to actually get into power in some areas of the world, and they haven't actually changed anything there either. The culture war continues to persist. Which means, when the frustration keeps growing inside of people, more and more spheres of society become battlegrounds. More and more people become the enemy. The only way the establishment is able to survive this long is if even more people are part of the establishment. Which leads me to, and I can't believe I'm saying this, the CIA and BreadTube. Ah, there we go. Got another costume change. I told you I'd had one in me. Listen, you may not like the amount of these I'm doing, but YouTube pays me an absurd amount every single time I change my outfit. That's why we're doing them. So, really, we're gonna talk about BreadTube discourse now? I really am feeding the bottom of the barrel. But believe it or not, BreadTube is a perfect example of conflict theory and imagined establishment. Also, if you're watching this video, you either see YouTube as a meaningless form of entertainment that you may learn something from and maybe helps radicalize you, but on the whole, it's just good fun. Or you may see it as the first and last line of defense against online fascism. And you may have heard of the label BreadTube, a label that encompasses both myself, but also a bunch of other left-wing-ish YouTube creators. First of all, you may have noticed that there's a significant amount of trans people on here. I mean, I think trans women make up like half a percentage point of global population numbers, but here on YouTube, we're like, like at least 85%. And I think one reason for this, there are probably others, I mean, not a lot of people hire trans people, we all end up here sooner or later, but I think another reason is that because of our transness, it is assumed that we will be anti-establishment, because the establishment doesn't look like me. And people who want to consume anti-establishment content reasonably seek out content creators who they see as anti-establishment. It is assumed that we'll be one of the good ones. However, this hyper-suspicion of authority and establishment seep into BreadTube as well. I've noticed in the last couple of years that as I've grown from having three followers on YouTube to having a quite substantial amount of followers, people have been more and more comfortable criticizing everything that I say. Not just because I post cringe, I do, but sometimes just for basically existing. If you've been in any online sphere, especially Twitter, you know that this is happening all the time. You're basically more likely to be the victim of bad faith arguments. And there's an argument to be had that this is just the law of large numbers. If you have a lot of followers, some of them are always going to be weird. And that's true. But I think that as creators grow in size, they become more disconnected from their own audience. And that might have to do with the creator becoming a different person and seeing themselves as above the rest. But I think it can also happen with the audience detaching itself from the creator, where success is equaled to establishmentism. This is, as mentioned, because people will lash out against power. They see power as a sign of being part of the ruling class. And if you're steeped within a specific subculture, you notice the power within those subcultures more than anywhere else. So if you are chronically online, for example, and your entire political ideology is steeped in watching YouTube videos, first, thank you for the watch time, but also you may think that the people who are popular here are somehow part of a mainstream establishment. I've seen this happen in other online spheres where people will take some actions or some social connections to mean that they have abandoned the masses and joined the elite forces of society. And I used to think that this was something that happened more to trans women. And I, I think it is. If you hate minorities, it's easier to do it if you think they're part of the establishment. But I do think that this suspicion of anything that has authoritative power 
is to blame as well. Of course, this isn't true. YouTubers do not have a significant amount of power. They have some, and I'll get to that. But when talking about who is in charge and who is the enemy, we have to go deeper than surface level. A common example that I want to mention is the idea of countering the arguments of PragerU or Ben Shapiro. They are definitely bad influences on online discourse. They're not helping anyone and they are, in my opinion, pretty evil. But are they the enemy? It's commonly said in debate culture that in order to counter bad narratives, we need to take the discussion with people like Ben Shapiro. But this is something that, in my opinion, doesn't really hurt the actual establishment. Because the people that you debate with are rarely the people who are actually making in the vast amounts of money that are funding these systems. The system itself is rather what's the cause here. So you could argue that that would be YouTube or Alphabet. Alphabet is one of the largest tech industries in the world, and a lot of the people who fund right-wing narratives on YouTube are actual petrochemical billionaires. They are funding an aesthetics that people will latch onto and attack, while at the same time being able to spread their ideas and also sometimes painting themselves as anti-establishment, even though, of course, they are protecting the status quo. So we actually have an example of this happening here on BreadTube specifically. And you know this is going to be about Jimmy Dore. About two months ago, fellow YouTuber Sean made a video highlighting some of the anti-vaccine lies of other fellow YouTuber Jimmy Dore. It's an excellent video, which I suggest that you check out. But for this though, it's only important to know that Jimmy lies a lot and doesn't like vaccine mandates and other COVID restrictions. Jimmy responds to this in a very interesting way. Sean, who made a video about you, and it was very strategically placed, it was algorithmically boosted on YouTube. Oh, it was so, definitely algorithmically boosted on YouTube. No fucking doubt about that, that that was given the favor treatment on YouTube, the CIA and the intelligence uh, beholden that Google and YouTube, they're in bed with the fucking intelligence community. Of course they are. Jimmy argues that because Sean's video was successful, that success wasn't genuine. It was based on collusion between Sean and the deep state, or the intelligence community. An argument he uses for this is to say that Sean's video was algorithmically boosted, whatever that means. That YouTube and Alphabet works for the CIA and has an interest to boost this video against him specifically. And the fact that Sean uses mainstream sources in his argument against Jimmy is another sign that he's working for the establishment. And the video attacking you, which relies heavily on official sources, you know, the FDA says that, the World Health Organization says that. This is, of course, absurd. Certainly YouTube and Alphabet and CIA hold a lot of established power. He's not wrong there. But there's quite a leap to say that because criticism of his worldview is popular, that popularity is proof of establishment interference. Of course, Sean isn't part of the CIA. This is an example of subcultural populist thinking, drawing a line in the sand between me and them. He is organizing based on anti-establishment thinking, but to such a degree that valid criticism is dismissed as part of a plot. And this sort of thinking isn't new in BreadTube's sphere either. Which brings me to the Mia Mulder book review corner. In the book, BreadTube Serves Imperialism, Caleb Maupin argues that BreadTube, as a community, or rather organization of creators, are actively working with establishment interests to sabotage the only few legitimate left-wing sources online. Legitimate meaning, mostly, hardcore Marxist-Leninists. The book is bad, that's my opinion as well as objective fact. I wouldn't suggest reading it even for research purposes. I actively regret reading it for this video. Um, instead, I would suggest that you please Google NFT furry fanfiction and just read the first result there instead. It will be better. The book suffers from poor writing, as well as logical leaps of taking the opinions of one or two YouTubers and assigning them to an entire online sphere. Arguing, in short, BreadTube works as one of these false anti-establishment movements for its own gain. Mostly by misrepresenting real leftism and steering people in the wrong path. In short, people disagree with Caleb online and therefore they must be working with the deep state. 
I think these opinions can only really come from a place of being extremely online. There's nothing wrong with that, I'm extremely online myself. But if you're seeing content creators as your primary form of political influence, content has become your ideology. And it can be easy to conflate success with power, especially within a subculture which values success a lot. On YouTube, we like having views and subscribers. Please, please like and subscribe, I'm so close to hitting 100,000. But if you ask random people in town about what they think about various left-wing YouTubers, even very powerful ones, odds are that many of them will simply ask, what's YouTube? I noticed people using this book and arguments of Jimmy Dore to justify sending threats and bigoted emails to YouTube creators. Now I don't think either Jimmy or Caleb condones that, and while I disagree with them, I wouldn't want them to be harassed either. But I suspect that a lot of people feel justified in doing this because they see an easy target, a way to fight back against what they think is the establishment. And this is actually what brings me back to Greta Thunberg. Because if you're chronically online, you may think that online video is the forefront of politics, but you probably also don't think that Greta Thunberg is part of any political establishment. But imagine yourself being chronically rural. Let's say that instead of being part of an online culture, you're instead part of a farming community. A community that relies heavily on gas cars and maybe live in a town where a lot of people work for the fossil fuel industry. All of that works as a lens through which you can see the world. And what you see is people talk about the environment in the cities, they talk about taxing your cars, your gas, and maybe taking away your job. And what you end up seeing is a collective of West Coast elites who are in charge of society and they want to crack down on you. And within that landscape, you see Greta Thunberg making the same type of arguments. And it's not that much of a leap to say that, hey, she's saying the same thing the establishment is saying. So she's probably up there with them. This, along with hyperattention on the acts of a teenager, not acting 100% perfect all the time, leads people to think that she's not actually believing anything that she's saying. The only reason why she's arguing in favor of the climate is because it's a grift. She's really just part of the establishment who want your tax dollars. And I think that this acts as one type of explanation as to why a lot of people felt justified in hating Greta Thunberg. She was on the cover of Times Magazine. She became a household name. She was famous. Of course, she's part of an establishment. And then of course, it's okay to harass her because I mean, her press agent is just gonna take care of it for her anyway. She becomes less of a person and more of an institution. An institution that is easy to vent frustration on, while the real cause of why things are becoming worse can avoid criticism. The wonderful thing about all this is that there are almost certainly lessons to be drawn here, and that we as a society will almost definitely, absolutely refuse to. And this doesn't just happen in the US, culture wars are happening all throughout the world about everything, it's happening in Hong Kong, where sometimes people will label themselves as pro-establishment because in their eyes, the establishment is actually doing something good. Because to them, maintaining the status quo is a good thing. And self-labeling happens in the European Union and in the US as well. Except the establishment here has a pretty bad intonation. So people will instead call themselves moderates. Or in Sweden, they'll call themselves the wide middle, <laughs> because we're a country of clowns. The idea here being that to prevent barbarism, we just need to hold on as tightly as we can to the status quo and refuse to change against everything. The problem is, we've seen how that turns out before. A big problem with anti-establishment thinking is that if you foster it, you will lose control of it, because it becomes self-sustaining. I think a big example of this is, once again, Donald Trump basically completely losing control of his own fan base. They still support him, but even though Donald Trump is very much pro-vaccine, the anti-establishmentism that he has fostered in his community has gone so far that they just won't listen to him and will refuse to listen to the leader. Because to them, the establishment is more evil than he is correct.
Like, honestly, I fully believe that, like, if the vaccine had been invented just, like, a few months earlier, Trump would have, like, successfully been able to, like, argue it as a big Trumpian victory. But because, like, most of the vaccine rollout happened under Biden, everyone just associates it with him. Honestly, Trump just had the worst timing. I do think that we, as mere mortals, have a tendency of misfiring a lot of the criticism that we have of the establishment, either by targeting basically anyone who can be vaguely associated with those in power, or we're way too vague with it in criticizing capitalism in general. Which is fair and good. Hit capitalism. Don't like it. But it's not like there's a CEO of capitalism out there watching my videos. Although if you are, please go to my Patreon. Um, I live in a society. I may hate money, but God knows I need it. Rather, and it sucks that it's like this, we need to work on recognizing who the enemy actually is. Is the enemy weird YouTubers that we don't like? Is the enemy really just some guy out there having bad takes? Or is it the people behind the scenes? The people at the very top? The people who have the strings to pull? And even then, if we get rid of those, who's to say that other people just won't rise into their place? The problem is the very foundation itself. I want people to think about these structures in a bit of a new way. And that when you find yourself in conflict with someone, think. Is this person really my enemy? Or have I only been tricked into thinking that they are? Hello, it's ad time now. You know I can help reduce conflict in your life by not being in conflict with yourself, uh, which maybe my next sponsor can help with, uh, which is the Fabulous app. It can help you set healthy habits, such as destroying all of the political establishment or drinking more water. It's very useful for me because I'm uh, very scatterbrained and it's it helps to have a sort of like habit maker in my life. It looks like this. Well, it's on my phone. Well, you know, it's, it's snap. You know what apps look like. Currently, I only have a wake-up routine and a bedtime routine. I don't have a, a workday routine um, yet, because if anything, I need to learn how to just like not work. I enjoy it a lot because it doesn't push me any harder than I want it to. It doesn't really tell me what to do. It's more I tell it so that it can remind me what I want to do, uh, which I like. It also gives you suggestions for accomplishable and like realistic goals that you can do and it like attunes itself to what you need and what you want. It's like having a little coach in your pocket that like helps you get on with your day, making sure you don't spend too much time on TikTok like I do. The app is free, but there's a subscription that unlocks more habits, all the content, as well as daily coaching sessions. And I haven't even mentioned challenges, setting your own schedules to habits. This thing will even read you a bedtime story. And if this sounds interesting or useful to you, start building healthy habits with the Fabulous app. The first 100 people who click the link in my description gets access to a 25% discount on the Fabulous subscription. So please do that. Drink more water, it's, it's good for you. Thanks for watching this video. I wanted to make something that was a bit more chill, uh, something to start off the year kind of big on, but at the same time something that is felt like old school Mia Mulder content. Uh, I hope I hope you liked it, even though it is like outdated by approximately six years. If you like this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You get to see extra streams and you get to be in the credits. And uh, speaking of that, you can actually see them rolling by right now. And I also want to thank specifically Aislinn, Alicia Crawford, Amanda B, Amara, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Ashley K, Aster Disaster, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Batgirl Allison, Catherine Stenson, Chloe Dollar, Christine Gutierrez, Kerbosphere, Cooper Morrison, Dana Ferguson, D. Mirandi Arisetto, Eleanor Cassidy, Ian Miltrzkowski, Emilia Clark, 
Eric Owens, Fox Kent, Henry R. Seymour, Jane Lusby, Donnell Torgerson, Jared Arnold, Jay Parker, Jane the Human, Jill Isabel Meyer, Stephanie Sterling, J.K.L., Jörgen, Joshua Analik, Julia Helene, L.P.Q. Silver, Linus Tvopuknoll, Madison Jacob, Meve Westall, Marcus Smith, Mari Neckar, Maurizio, Mia, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Neil Anderson, Nicholas Kapoor, Nyufbun, OPB, Remy, Rose Brunton, Rose H, Riley Knox, Samantha Chandra Rowan, Wife of Heather, Goddess of Thunder, Sean, No More No Less, Citrees, Sevilla Razan, Sonic Bread, Thea Vega, Thoris of Mir, Tulips, William Fuhassel, Wawa Warm Goose, Violet Tosukas Harrison, Vivian Crow, and Wolfgang, the Grand High, Exalted Wizard. Thank you.